There are different viewpoints out there as regards what can we believe. The relativist says there are no absolutes. The skeptic says we cannot know anything with certainty. The atheist says definitively there is no God. The agnostic dials it back a little bit and says, well, there may be a God, maybe not. We just can't know him. And then there's the receptivist. That's someone who says, I'm open to learning about God. I'm, I'm willing to hear the facts and then make a decision. When someone, especially the, the person who's open, when someone is in that place, we, we don't have to be afraid or intimidated by the, those who raise questions about our faith in Jesus. We believe the truth. Those are opportunities to explain the truth behind what we believe. And Peter actually spoke to this. Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? For even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you're blessed. And do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. We're to be kind of uh, defenders on call. When questions are raised, we don't shy away from those. What we believe is the truth. And by the way, I can prove it. And so can you if you've embraced the word. Now, what does that defense look like? I mean, how, how do you defend the faith? The passage we're going to look at this morning is rich with nuggets that declare ours to be a very reasonable faith. The passage is fairly well known. It concerns a member of Jesus' inner circle named Thomas, who's seen here in Da Vinci's Last Supper. Uh, do you know which one is Thomas? Uh, da Vinci tried to capture the character of each one. And the one who's right next to Jesus, kind of crowding in like this, that's Thomas in his picture. It's kind of, uh, you know, later on he's going to say, unless I touch. And so he's kind of the, the facts guy, at least according to that, that picture. What do we know about him? Well, he has a brother or a sister who is a twin. He is at one place called the twin. So uh, there were twins uh, at Bible times, as there are today. And so apparently he has a brother or a sister who is his twin. He's named in all three lists of the 12. And he is paired with Levi, who's Matthew, when Jesus commissions them to go out two by two. And so he and Matthew, the tax collector were put together as compadres in the ministry of the gospel to different places. He took his commitment to the Lord quite seriously. Here's an interesting statement. This is earlier in the season of Jesus training the 12. And this is John 11, 7 and 8. And he says, uh, then after this, he, Jesus said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi... The Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? In other words, this is a really bad idea. Are you sure you want to do that? This is kind of insane. Do you have a death wish? But Thomas said this, which speaks to who he is. Therefore, Thomas, who is called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go so that we may die with him. Now, you know, he has this sense of, you know, here's, here's what's going to happen. <laughs> but I'm willing to go die. I don't want to live if Jesus is not alive. Now, he says, I'm willing to die with him. There's a little bit of a poor self-assessment there because Thomas, along with all the disciples, fled when Jesus was betrayed. Here's another glimpse into who Thomas is. This is from the Upper Room Discourse. The night in which Jesus was betrayed, Thomas said to him, when Jesus was saying, I I'm headed somewhere else. <laughs> he says, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How, how do we know the way? Help, help us out here. Well, he's capable of acknowledging what he doesn't know. That's a strength too. Uh, some people will say, yeah, I got this. 
and you know they don't. <laughs> One or two weeks after today, what we're doing in this series is basically tracing the events that followed the resurrection in real time. So this morning, we're looking at something that happened on this exact day. Next week, we'll do the same and a few weeks after that. Uh, so one or two weeks after today, he's fishing with Peter on a very eventful day that we'll talk about next Sunday. 42 days after today, he is with the other 10 and 120 or so in an upper room in Jerusalem on Pentecost. And he is baptized and became one of Jesus' spirit-inspired witnesses. There are historical records that suggest he actually went as far as uh, Western India with the gospel. Now, I need to explain something called time-release truth before we jump into the passage with Thomas and explain what this is. Sometimes Jesus taught the disciples something which did not make sense until after his resurrection. He would teach it to them and then afterwards they'd go oh and they'd recall it for example early in his ministry Jesus was talking to the crowd and he was saying you know you tear down this temple and in three days I'll build it and he was referring to himself they're, they're all going oh okay John 2 22 says so when he was raised from the dead his disciples remembered that he said this and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken in other words, the light bulb didn't go off until after the resurrection, and then they realized that something Jesus said two years before made sense. Uh, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, this would be two weeks ago from today, John 12, 16, they're watching all of this. These things his disciples did not understand at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, when they remembered that these things were written of him and that they had done these things to him, the light bulb didn't dawn until after the resurrection and they go oh what he said here makes sense what, what was he saying he was saying i say to you you shall not see me until you say blessed is he who comes in the name of the lord and then they realized oh <laughs> it's not happening now it's later on Sunday, on the Emmaus Road, last Sunday we looked at this, Jesus said, your problem is you don't understand all the scriptures. My death was necessary. It's a part of God's good plan to do you good. Do you see what's happening here? Jesus is talking about the resurrection before his death, and nobody's getting it. <laughs> it's kind of like, ah, So when someone says, well, obviously the disciples got together and they said, you know, Jesus predicted a resurrection and he's dead, but we're going to make it look like he arose. So let's go ahead and create a myth here. They had no clue. It wasn't until after the resurrection. So when somebody wants to say, which this is one of the theories by which people decide that Jesus didn't arise and... Uh, the disciples were not in a place to make this up. They don't really get it. No one was prepared for what happened. Made it up? Definitely not. So uh, let's cut the disciples some slack, including Thomas. Here's the passage, but Thomas, we're starting in verse 24, but Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with him when, Tom, when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now Thomas is having a faith crisis we do not know why Thomas was not there a week ago when they met in this room where Jesus showed himself to them. But after last Sunday, they were saying, and it was all week long, uh, 
the, the verb is, is they were saying, which is a form of it where it's, this was happening all week long. The women who went to the tomb saw the empty tomb. They actually met Jesus later. Uh, Cleopas and his companion on the Emmaus Road, they met Jesus. Then Jesus showed up at the upper room. There were all these different appearances. Maybe there were others. I don't know. So all during the week, these people are saying, we've seen him. We've seen Jesus. And he says, and by the way, he says, I will not believe. Uh, we don't do this in English where uh, you can use double negatives to actually make it even stronger. So basically, this is what he's saying. He uses ume. No way, no how will I believe unless Jesus meets my fivefold test. He is absolutely convinced that Jesus is dead. I mean, he was here. I don't know where he was, but he sees Jesus. He sees he's dead. And he has this overwhelming, visceral, sensory response. That's what he sees in his eyes. So when these different ones are saying, no, he's alive. You expect me to believe that? I was there. I don't know where. I saw. I saw. I see, the, and the nails would go through here, by the way. It's not, you often see pictures where they put it here in the, in the middle of the palm. Uh, the bone structure is not such that it would support the body weight. They would put the nails here between the two bones. You have two bones that are this part of your arm. And they would put them right between those two. So here's the places where the nails are. The sword mark. <laughs> now, by the way, one of the ways that people discount the resurrection is something called the swoon theory. Jesus didn't really die. He just passed out. And then they buried him in the tomb, and he later, you know, the cool, refreshing tomb, I guess, uh, right. He, uh, you know, kind of revived, and then he was apparently capable of, I don't know, budging the stone enough to come out or whatever. And I'm going, you're nuts. Thomas tells me, even the, the other 10 tell me from a week ago, I see it, he's dead. The 10 were in the same boat as Thomas last week. They all saw Jesus die. I don't know from what vantage point. I know that John was there because he, he was at the foot of the cross with Mary, Jesus' mother, and he says, you're going to take care of my mom from this point. I'm not going to be here. Behold your, mo your mother, behold your son. They all saw the wounds. Someday I'll tell more about this story, but uh, I can identify. Uh, I was five years old. My brother, Tommy, was three. We were playing in the front yard. And Tommy went down two doors to go play at Cheryl Golden's house. And this was in the 50s when they used to deliver milk. Remember, you'd have the, the milkman that would come and put the milk on the front doorstep and take the old bottles. Right as Tommy passed behind that vehicle, the milkman jumped in, backed up, and I watched my brother get crushed by the rear tire of that vehicle. And I still see it. It's as vivid now as then. That was Thomas's experience. That was the tens experience. And they are seeing this. Earlier, last week, Jesus came into this room. And John 20, 20 says this, and when he had said this, peace to you, <laughs> he showed them both his hands and his side and the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Yeah, I still see in my mind's eye Jesus on the cross and his limp body being lowered 
for a couple of the Jewish guys to take to a tomb. But I see Jesus alive in front of me. And they knew. Thomas has not had the benefit of this experience. Thomas was not there. And so he's in the position of having to weigh the testimony of those who say, we've seen him, we've seen him, against this vivid personal perception. I saw him dead. And we read, after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. So they're gathered together, the 11 of them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, which that's a repeat of what happened the previous week, and stood in their midst and said, peace be with you. Then he turned to Thomas and he said, reach, reach here with your finger. See my hands. Uh, reach here your hand and And put it into my side. And do not be unbelieving, but believing. Now this is a repeat of what happened the week before. They're locked in. Jesus enters. And Thomas is not having a doubt problem. There's there's two different words that I want to compare. You remember when Peter was walking on the water and then it said he doubted? That's the word distazo. And you don't have to worry about memorizing that. But just I'm going to show you the contrast. So here's the stadza, which means he's, he's going, he starts looking at the waves. And he's focused on the waves and not on the Lord. Always a bad plan to see the, the trial and not see Jesus. And he experiences the stadza, this doubt, this kind of, ah. That's not the word that is used here of Thomas. It's ah pistos. Pistos is faith. Ah is what's called an alpha privative. It means no faith disbelief Jesus command do not be unbelieving is a present imperative it means you have been in this pattern of no faith stop this has got to be stopped Jesus Language then answers perfectly to the terms of Thomas's test. Remember, he says, I see Jesus on the cross. And unless he's, I see A, B, C, D, I am not believing. So Jesus issues a command, actually five commands, five imperatives. He says, reach here your finger. See my hands. Reach here your hand and put it into my side. And then he says this, and stop being unbelieving. Jesus knew exactly what Thomas wanted. He accepted Thomas's faith challenge. Thomas said, I am not going to believe unless A, B, C, D. And Jesus says, here I am, A, B, C, D. Here you go. And Thomas answered and said, my Lord and my God. Now, the text doesn't tell us whether Thomas actually did his test, you know, whether he said, okay, hang on, Jesus, let me look at my list. Okay, first, okay. He didn't, there's nothing that says that happened. It was this immediate, bold statement. His encounter was enough. And Thomas says something that goes beyond anything yet heard pertinent to Christ. It is the faith climax of John's gospel. John is telling a story that is about responses to Jesus, and this one by Thomas is kind of the climactic moment that goes beyond anything previously recorded in John. I'll give you a couple samples. Many disciples withdrew at one point, but Peter affirmed, we have believed... And come to know that you are the Holy One of God. So here's Peter, about midway through Jesus' ministry. Some have decided, you know, we're going to check out of this. And he says, we're not going anywhere because we believe you are the Holy One of God. And what he means by that is you're the one anointed by God. You're God's representative. You're God's man. 
Well, that's good. That's true. He is God's man. But you're not quite there yet. That's close. In John 10, 33, the Jews who were reacting against Jesus, they said, for a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. Now, they didn't buy it, but they said, you are proclaiming, I am God. The Jews got it, they just didn't accept it. What Thomas is saying would be considered blasphemy. But he's absolutely convinced that, two things, Jesus is Lord and Jesus is God. But there's one more nugget. He adds the word, my. Thomas is acknowledging the supremacy of Jesus. That's Lord. He's in charge. He's acknowledging the deity of Jesus. He is God. Everything that is true of God is true of Jesus. But by using the word my, what he's saying is, he is my Lord. He is my God. And I am submitting to him as my Lord and my God. He is the Lord, my Lord. And he is God, my God. Here in very human, albeit resurrected and living flesh, In Jesus' resurrection body, you catch glimpses of this in the book of Revelation in the mountain vision, which is uh, Revelation 4 through 16. Apparently, even in a resurrection body, his wounds, you're going to be able to see them. We'll see them. And we someday look at him face to face. He says, my Lord and my God. You know, hmm, where have I heard that somewhere else in the Bible? The Apostle John, who was there when Thomas said this, records something that happened in this heavenly vision in the second section of the book of Revelation. And here's what we read in Revelation 4.11. The 24 elders say, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and because of your will they existed and were created. Thomas is actually saying something that 24... Uh, highly esteemed angelic beings recount in the book of Revelation. I wonder if John was going when he's in heaven, my Lord and my God, our Lord, my God. I've heard that somewhere. Uh, Thomas, he said that. (laughs) Now think about this for a minute. Here is a guy who is saying, I will not believe. I see him on the cross. I see his body on the cross. He is dead. And he arrives at a place a week later, a little over a week later, where he says, he's alive. He is God. He is Lord. And he is my God and my Lord. How does somebody go from here to here if it's not the truth? D.A. Carson, a scholar, like what he says here, get this the most unyielding skeptic has bequeathed to us the most profound confession. This is the guy who said, ooh, may, no way, no how am I going to believe. And he's arrived at this place where he says, my God, my Lord. There is no accounting for Thomas's confession apart from the receipt of convincing proof. Then Jesus pronounces a blessing This blessing is actually on you. Jesus is capable of looking through time and seeing all those who have come to him. And here's what he says. Jesus said to him, said to Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. Jesus graciously provided the requested evidence by delivering it in person to Thomas. But it's not going to be in person for everybody. I know Jesus. I've never seen him. But I know he is alive and he is my Lord and my God. I pray that that is true of you as well. But not because he personally came to me. I had an encounter with him 
someday I'll explain it, but it wasn't him doing for me what he did for Thomas. And Jesus actually says, get this, congratulations, you who believe not having seen me. Jesus is going to ascend into heaven at this moment. And those who will then believe will do so without the benefit of seeing the resurrected Lord. But that belief is no less real. Peter said, and though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. You know, there's, there's a command, for example, in the book of Revelation. There's a bunch of commands, but this is the one I want to focus on. He says, behold, he is coming with the clouds. And behold is a command to do. He's actually saying, I want you to see this. Stop looking at all the news and getting discouraged. I want you to look past it, look through it, and see me coming. I haven't seen him yet, but he is my Lord and my God, and I can't wait. This is a new beatitude. Blessed are you who don't see but believe, and Jesus says you are to be congratulated. Now, we can benefit from Thomas's account, even though we have not yet personally seen him, but we will because of the fact that he shows us that even a dyed-in-the-wool skeptic can arrive at a place based on the evidence of saying that Jesus actually did what he said he would do. So, okay, what do I do with this passage, Jim? How do I apply it to my life? Well, first first point of application, ask yourself, is Jesus my Lord? Is he the boss of my life? Am I doing what he tells me to do? I'm not talking about the Lord. I'm talking about my Lord. The demons are quite cognizant (laughs) that there is but one God, and they're terrified of him. Uh, In James, we read, you believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. And it's all well and good to say, Jesus is God. Is he your God? Is he your Lord? Well, that's a great question to ask. If someone were to follow you around this week, would they draw the conclusion, well, it's obvious to me that you are serving someone other than yourself. Tell me about him. He is your Lord, if that's the case. All right, let me tell you one more application point. Jesus does hurdles. (laughs) What would happen if Jesus never appeared to Thomas? You know, what if Thomas says, I am not going to believe unless A, B, C, D. And Jesus ignores him. Would he become another casualty like Judas? But Jesus did appear to him. And he provided exactly what Thomas needed. He knew what Thomas had said. He said, hey, Thomas, last week you said you need A, B, C, D. Okay, let's do A, B, C, D. I'm here to provide whatever you need to experience a spiritual breakthrough. Thomas is proof that Jesus is willing to work with faith tests. Do you know a friend or a coworker, family member, relative, who would say, I will no way, no how believe in Jesus unless or until he may be see. You can ask him, what are your faith hurdles? What stands between you And saying, my Lord, my God. Well, you can start praying for that person right now for God to pull an Operation Thomas with your unbelieving friend. You can ask the question, who's your Thomas? And by the way, uh, Thomas was forced to make a choice. You know, Jesus presented the evidence to him and said, stop unbelieving. Start believing. A Thomas is going to have to make a choice, but God is willing to provide the information. Now, you might say, yeah, but that's just a one-off. I mean, that was uh, 
You know, that was Thomas, but God doesn't do that. Otherwise, does he? A man from Ethiopia said, I can't make sense of Isaiah 53 on my own. I don't, I don't know what to make of this. And the Holy Spirit directed Philip to intercept his chariot with just what this man needed for spiritual breakthrough. And he understood Isaiah 53 because of what Philip told him. And he believed and he said, why can't I be baptized? He said, there's some water. And he was baptized on the spot. That was a Thomas encounter. A man in, a Roman centurion, man in Caesarea, he didn't know what he was missing. God did. So God sent an angel who told him what to do to access what he needed. And he said, send a, a group of your servants to this city and go find this guy named Simon Peter and he will come. And he'll tell you what you need to know. And the end product was that he and his whole household believed and they were baptized and received the Holy Spirit. I'll tell you a personal Thomas story. So back when I was a regular pastor before I became whatever I am now, uh, I had a church and I was there for about 25 years. And I remember that I would you know, go meet different people after the service and so on. And I saw this young woman kind of by herself Went and talked with her. Uh, Hi, I'm Pastor Jim. Tell me about you. And uh, she was uh, from South Africa. She was going to be an au pair uh, who was going to help a family. And uh, she had met someone from our church on a flight. And that person had said, come to our church. So she came. And I started to drill down a little on the questions, just asking, you know, what's going on? Where are you at? And... Uh, came down to this question so why have you not accepted Jesus as your savior and she says I have too many questions and nobody can answer them and I said well I don't know if I can answer your questions but I'm, I'm willing to give it a shot so if you want to uh, you can come into the office uh, during the week and we'll have a conversation so she started doing that and so she would come in the office and she would say I would say, so what's your question? She would give me one. I would say, okay, that's a great question. Let me help you understand the answer to that. Next week, another, another, another. I don't know how long it went, but for a while. One time she was there and I said, okay, so what's your question? And she said, I don't need to ask any more questions. I said, well, because I've answered all your questions? And she said, no. But every question you've a I've asked, you've answered with a good answer. I'm ready to surrender to Jesus. And she did. That was a Thomas encounter. Now, you might say, well, you know, maybe that happened for you, Jim. Surely, I mean, does God really do that? And I'm here to tell you, he even does it, does it among you. Hey, Matthew, come on up. Uh, so I've had a chance to you know, get acquainted with different ones of you. And uh, Matthew was sharing with me kind of his story of how he came to Jesus. Come on up here with me. And he said something that I thought, well, that's fascinating. Would you be willing to share it? And he said, yes. And then I snagged him this morning and he's good to go. Yeah. So uh, basically you uh, were in, would it be uh, high school, maybe about ninth or 10th grade, and you're struggling with... How do I make sense of all this? Help me understand. Help them understand what yeah. I'm talking about. Uh, so I grew up in a, a Catholic slash Mormon home, which don't ask how that works. Um, so I uh, actually got saved uh, my freshman year in college um, and really had a lot of uh, just different um, opinions, voices from the Catholic side, from the Mormon side, and was really just trying to uh, wade through that. Um, and that brought up a lot of doubts, a lot of questions, and so one, uh, one morning, I remember, uh, I just said, God, I, I can't do this. I need an answer from your word that I can stand on to know uh, for sure. Um, I was reading through Proverbs, and I read, there's a way that seems right to man, but in the end leads to death. Um, and, and that was my answer. And what happened? I mean, you, you, know, you read the, that. And yeah, the doubt's just gone. I knew. It I knew. Just dissipated yeah and I haven't I haven't doubted I um, there's questions that come up but I'm 
I get my answer from the warden. And so basically, it, I mean, were you reading Proverbs and it was like you saw the verse and it connected yeah. to you or something? Yeah, I just was, I was reading through Proverbs and uh, read, I think it's 1425. And uh, I put it on the screen there. Yeah. And it's one of the few things, mm -hmm. few statements in Scripture that's actually said twice. Mm -hmm. It's in Proverbs 14:12 and 16:25, mm -hmm. which says, "There is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death." Yeah. And I am so grateful that God, in a moment where you're trying to sort it out, uh, allowed you to see something yeah. that just connected and yeah. helped you to get to a place of certainty yeah. of faith in Jesus. Yeah. And then things move forward from there. Yeah. Cool, love yeah. it. Thanks, Matthew. Yeah, Thanks yeah. for sharing. Jesus is more than capable of supplying what your Thomas lacks. He's open to doing so. Will you ask him to supply what your Thomas needs to come to Jesus in faith to affirm he is my Lord and my God? Uh, in the bulletin, you have a card that looks like this, an insert. And it says, who is your Thomas? And it says, do you know a friend or a coworker or a neighbor or a relative who would say, I will no way know how believe in Jesus unless or until he fill in the blank. Thomas's story tells us that Jesus is willing to provide what a Thomas lacks to name him as my Lord and my God. Will you pray for Jesus to supply exactly what your Thomas needs to come to Jesus and believe? And there's a place for you to write down, my Thomas is named, and then what would I like God to do? Now, I'll give you one passage that you can write down that you could use. This is 2 Timothy 2, 24 and 25, which says that God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, and that they may escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. Uh, you may have a, a son or a daughter, a mom or a dad, someone you work with, a friend, a neighbor, maybe someone you encountered at the gym or whatever. But you would say, when you talk about Thomas, who is someone who's saying, I can't believe this stuff. Would you write down their name and would you write down a, a little bit about what do you want God to do with that person? And then here's my encouragement to you. I'd like you to take this card and stick it on a mirror or on a coffee table or something and every day pray for your Thomas. Pray for God to work because God is willing to give Thomas what he needs. He is willing to give the Ethiopian eunuch what he needs. He's able to give this Roman centurion what he needs. He's able to give Matthew what he needs. He's able to give your Thomas what is needed because he's not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. That's the longing of his heart. So I'm gonna just be quiet for a couple minutes and I'm gonna let you fill out that card, but you write it down right here and now. I want to do it here while there's no distractions so that you have an opportunity to just write down, who's your Thomas? What do you want God to do? Let's take a couple minutes and you do that, and then I'll tell you what's next.
Do you have their name on the card? Let me tell you about something that you can do in addition to what, you're, what I've asked you to do. I want you to take that card. There may be more you want to write. But, uh, you know, we're going to sing a song to conclude the service, and then Bob is going to come up with a few words. But uh, there will be some people over there by that screen or, and there by that window. And they're willing to pray for you and your Thomas. Uh, and you can bring your card up. You can say, here's who I got. And they will pray with you so that you're not alone in praying for your Thomas, whoever it is. So right after the service, if you want someone to pray with you, uh, they will be there. There was a good group last service who were saying that and then saying, I, I need prayer from others as well. Uh, I will also, uh, I'll be over there with that group and I'll be there if you would say, you know what? I don't know about praying for a Thomas. I might be a Thomas and I, I need help. Great. I would be happy to talk with you as well. So anyway, I'm gonna, I'd like you to just hold your card in your hand right now, and I'm going to pray for all the Thomases who are represented by those cards, all right? Father, I am pleading with you. Open their eyes. You know all these people whose names are written on these cards. You know who they are. You know what they lack. Would you open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who've been sanctified by faith in Jesus. Would you give them what they need to arrive at a place where they are able to say, my Lord, my God. I wouldn't dare ask this if it weren't for the fact that you have instructed us in your world to cut word to come boldly before the throne of grace, pleading for grace and mercy in time of need. And so we are doing that in the name of Jesus because he is our God and our Lord. Amen.